What's up guys? This episode of Wheelhouse is brought to you by Squarespace. Stay tuned till the end of the episode for a special offer for Wheelhouse fans. I'll see you then. Two powerful executives conspire to commit millions of dollars in fraud and end up damaging the reputations of several billion dollar car companies in the process. The perps are the head of Nissan, Renault, and Mitsubishi, Carlos Ghosn, and his crony, Greg. The crime? Well, the charges haven't actually been filed yet, but Donuts Crack research team thinks it's probably going to be something along the lines of multiple counts of being naughty boys. Ironically. Business is the most boring part of the car business, but Carlos Ghosn, he's earned a lot of nicknames in his tenure. Le Cost Killer, Mr. 7-Eleven, The Icebreaker. Before he was known for getting in trouble, Carlos Ghosn was known for changing the game in his 40 years in the auto industry. Look, we're not excusing his behavior by any means, but villains need a backstory just as much as heroes do. Unless you're the Joker. Look, the whole point of the Joker is that we don't know his backstory. We don't need a movie about him. We don't need Jared Leto tattooing his forehead. That sucks. Stop making movies about the Joker unless Batman's in it. That's my hot take. Carlos Ghosn was born in Brazil to parents of Lebanese and French descent. His grandpa was a self-made entrepreneur and eventually headed a few different companies, including one involving the rubber trade. This might have been inspiration for young Carlos, whose first big job after college was working for the South American division of Michelin Tires. The execs at Michelin took a liking to the young, hard-working Carlos and sent him to France and Germany to train and work. In 1981, three years after starting at Michelin, he became plant manager at Le Puy le Valais, France. After three more years of managing the plant in France, he was appointed head of research and development for Michelin's industrial tire division. It was clear this kid was going places. In 1985, having only worked for the company for seven years, a supple 30-year-old Carlos was promoted to chief operating officer of Michelin's South American operations. That's huge. Bart is 60 years old, and I wouldn't trust him with anything bigger than a cat. But Ghosn's rise in the company did not come without a few bumps in the road. Michelin wasn't doing too well in Brazil, due to the struggling economy and hyperinflation at the time. Ghosn was tasked with setting the tire company on a new, more profitable trajectory straight from the man himself, Francois Michelin. He drew from Brazil's own multicultural makeup and boiled it down to what worked the best. From this experience, Ghosn formed the basis of his cross-cultural management style and emphasis on diversity as a core business asset, which he would bring with him to every future job. The young hotshot was onto something. The South American division of Michelin returned to profitability within just two short years of Ghosn being promoted to COO. Results like that in that short of a time frame are all but unheard of. At the ripe old age of just 35, he was named CEO. Just like Entourage, the E makes all the difference. In 1996, nearly 20 years after he started at Michelin, Carlos Ghosn became the Executive Vice President of Purchasing, Advanced Research, Engineering and Development, Powertrain Operations and Manufacturing, basically everything at Renault. As if that was enough to worry about, he was also put in charge of Renault's South American operations as well. As soon as he started at Renault, Ghosn began dramatically restructuring operations. Renault CEO, Luis Schweitzer, 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 Renault's CEO, Luis Schweitzer, tasked Ghosn with confronting their financial problems. Ghosn laid out a plan to revise production processes, standardize vehicle parts, push the launch of new vehicles, and reduce Renault's workforce. Inspired by Japanese factories, he introduced a lean production system, and it worked. Renault returned to profitability in an extremely short amount of time. It was great for everyone still working at the company, but a lot of people were laid off during the reform. The radical restructuring earned Carlos the nickname Le Cost Killer, which is Franglish for the cost killer. I knew my French lessons would come in handy one day. Thanks, James. Soon after the company was saved from shuttering, Renault and Nissan formed an alliance. It wasn't quite a merger. Nissan had been losing money for six of the last seven years and were weighed down by a buttload of debt. So Renault helped them out by purchasing 36% of Nissan, worth about $5.8 billion. Ghosn's list of titles grew as he was named COO of Nissan in May of 1999, in addition to his extensive roles at Renault. 
He rolled out his Nissan Revival plan, which outlined a proposal that had three main goals. One, return to profitability by the year 2000. Two, a profit margin in excess of 4.5% of sales by the end of the fiscal year of 2002. And three, a 50% reduction in the current level of debt by the end of that same year. Ghosn personally promised that if these goals weren't met, he would resign. That's a boss move. Nissan had been the first to design a small SUV concept in 1991, but it never went into production. Meanwhile, they watched as Honda and Toyota killed the game with their CRV and RAV4. Ghosn vowed to not let this happen again, and they got right to work. In the first half of 1999, Nissan debuted the brand new Frontier, Xterra, and a redesigned Maxima, and sales immediately jumped 3.6%. Once again, a failing company had been saved from bankruptcy by the hand of Carlos Ghosn. And by 2001, Nissan bought a 15% stake in Renault, who returned the favor by investing back into Nissan, bringing Renault's stake in Nissan up to 44%. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Everything on the business side was going great, but Ghosn's plan also included shutting down five factories in Japan and laying off 21,000 employees. The country was already outside of their comfort zone when they hired a non-Japanese COO, and his first move was to axe a bunch of factories? This was a slap in the face of Japan. It seemed he had no respect for Japanese business etiquette. He was starting to get a ton of negative feedback, understandably. That is, until the numbers came in. In 1999, Nissan lost $6.4 billion, but in 2000, they made $2.7 billion after taxes. He might have shat all over Japanese business customs, but he did come through on his promise. Ghosn's plan for the next three years was called Nissan 180. By 2005, he wanted Nissan to increase their vehicle output by 1 million cars a year while maintaining at least 8% profit margin and reducing debt to zero. Nissan announced the debt had been eliminated in the fiscal year of 2002, and they met their vehicle production increase quota, and profitability reached 11.1%. Just to show you how far they came, profitability in 1999 was 1.4%. I'm no math boy, but that number is a lot bigger than that number. In 2005, Carlos Ghosn was named CEO of both Renault and Nissan, making him the first person in history to run two Fortune 500 companies simultaneously. Wow, and I thought it was impressive to fart and poop at the same time. I don't even wanna know what would happen if I sneezed. Ghosn's power was growing. In the late 2000s, he was named chairman, president, and CEO of both Renault and Nissan, Optivaz, a Russian automaker that you can learn about from this video, made Carlos Ghosn deputy chairman of the board of directors. In October of 2016, the Renault-Nissan alliance welcomed a little brother, Mitsubishi, into their family. Nissan invested billions in the Mitsubishi and ended up with a controlling 34% stake in the company. The group was renamed the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi alliance. Ah, it just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Not so surprisingly, Ghosn was named chairman of the board of directors for Mitsubishi. Power and money seemed to find Carlos Ghosn wherever he went, but his luck was about to run out. <laughs> On November 19th of this year, Ghosn was arrested for trying to re-enter Japan. While he wasn't formally charged with anything upon his arrest, he was brought in over allegations of false accounting. And three days later, Nissan announced they had dismissed Ghosn and stripped him of his executive powers. On November 26th, Mitsubishi fired Ghosn as well. And as of the filming of this right now, Ghosn retains his title of chairman and CEO of Renault. Someone inside Nissan blew the whistle on Ghosn and struck a plea deal. They alleged that Carlos Ghosn and Greg Kelly concealed $82 million of income since 2010. I mean, that's a lot of money left unaccounted for. How does one hide $82 million exactly? Well, as chairman of the board, Ghosn was in charge of deciding his own salary. Worried about the potential backlash regarding his high salary, Ghosn made public only a fraction of what he was getting paid and diverted the rest to be paid after his retirement. As the story keeps developing, more details will emerge and more crimes are sure to be uncovered. For example, during the 2008 financial crisis, Ghosn diverted his own financial losses to Nissan. When Ghosn's bank called him for more collateral on his investments, he handed the rights over derivatives trades to Nissan, which moved $15 million worth of his own debt over to the company. It's pretty smart, but pretty evil. Carlos Ghosn is worth around $100 million, but probably plenty more in unreported income. 
For all the good he did, revitalizing car companies that we love and saving them from bankruptcy, he really screwed a lot of people. But luckily, the charges keep mounting and we can take some solace in the fact that he'll probably spend a lot of time in prison, if not for the rest of his life, or he'll just get away with it. For a guy who's had many nicknames throughout his life, only one of them matters now. Fresh meat. Hey guys, thanks for watching the episode. Walking to the office now. Oh, there's Tony Angelo's car right there. I wanna to talk to you guys about this week's sponsor, Squarespace. Oh, there's James's car right there. Anyway, you've probably heard of Squarespace. It's the all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create a vibrant and beautiful website for your brand or business. <laughs> Flip flop. Guys, 2019 will be here faster than you know it. And if you're thinking about starting a business, there's no better platform than starting something for your brand than with Squarespace. Cool little Subaru right here. Sweet. With Squarespace, you can easily manage your online store, track and manage orders, and even track your site's analytics with easy to use tools. And if you already own a domain name, that's not a problem because Squarespace makes it super easy to transfer your domain over to a website you made with Squarespace. If you're ready to build a beautiful website, go to squarespace.com. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash wheelhouse for 10% off your first domain name or website. Please remember to use that link because it really helps us out and we can keep making more sweet videos. Gucci truck again. Thank you. Buy our stuff. What's up guys, we got a lot of new uh, merch on our website. This is called the Hold the Line. It's really sick. Other shirts besides these ones. Just check it out. Go to donutmedia.com and check out all of our cool shirts. This one has freaking donuts on it. Literal donuts. I thought we were past the baking motif, but we're not. Also, we got a new hoodie. Look how awesome this thing is. This is Jesse Wood, by the way, creative director. Basically the central nervous system behind Donut. Buy our stuff. Thanks for watching Wheelhouse. We look at the news that affects you in the car world. So hit that yellow subscribe button right there so you never miss an episode. I mentioned Avtovaz. Check them out in this video right here. Check out this episode of Science Garage. Follow me on Instagram at Nolan J Sykes. Follow Donut on Instagram at Donut Media. Be nice. I'll see you next time.